Welcome back to another episode of the Craft Beer Voyager Show. I'm your host, Michael Thack. This week we have voyaged down to Austin, Texas to a small independent craft brewery called Adelbert's Brewery. They're best known for their Belgian style ale, but now they've expanded their brewing line to include barrel aged beers, sour ales, as well as many other intriguing styles and flavors. Today, owner and founder Scott Hobie will show us around their unique brewing process, their bottling line, as well as their awesome tap room. Go ahead and join me. Cheers. So we usually we start the tour uh, in the other end of uh, in our uh, raw material warehouse. So we'll head down that way. Kind of walk you quickly through the whole process of doing it. Sounds good. Actually brewing today, so I apologize for all the noise. A little bit of music going on. Oh yeah. Ambiance a little bit. So this is our raw material warehouse. Uh, you know, beer starts with malt. We our base malt is a Czech Pilsner. We get directly from the Czech Republic. They've been continuously malting for the last 400 years. Uh, they still spread it out on the stone floor to germinate and uh, you know, do the malt process. Uh, then they dry it and put it in these super sacks and ship it to us. Beautiful, beautiful. The, uh, so, once, uh, so we'll take the malt, we'll grind it, we have the mill back in, the, back in this area. It's in a closed space because the uh, you know, mill is very dusty. Uh, we'll auger it into a uh, grain hopper up here. And from there, the grain drops down in the mash tun. The mash tun is where we'll add water to the malt, the, 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 the malt house made. Activate some enzymes and convert starches to sugars. And if you're making wine or cider, you know, the fruit is already in a sugar state. Uh, the grain is much more work because it's uh, stored as a starch. So the starch needs to be converted to sugars for the yeast can consume it and make alcohol. Brewing process, kind of a high level, is we're converting starch to sugar. And now, uh, we've got other variables too. We can add different malts. If you want to make a darker beer, we'll add more like caramel or caramel malts. Or you can do different base malts. Like if you're doing well, what do you all currently have in your uh, brew kettles right now? Uh, today, we are making a scratching hippo. So that's uh, still mostly of our base Pilsner malt. But it's got uh, some Munich and uh, I think some uh, deep bitter black. Uh, we actually use we switched to Cascade on this. It's actually oh, a nice uh, fruity, uh, works nice in an amber, uh, and it's a very available hop. It's just a nice one to use in high volume beer. Okay. Um, we actually have uh, two mash tuns. The second mash tun we use for doing decoctions. So on some of our beers, especially a lot of the old traditional Belgian beers, we'll actually do a decoction where we uh, pull part of the mash, boil it, mix it back in. That adds uh, some more. Uh, layered reaction, a little more caramelization, more complexity to the malt flavor. Uh, from there it goes to the lauder ton. The lauder ton is basically just has a big uh, false bottom and it allows the sugar water that we you know, pull from the sugars and pull from the grain and now the liquid form, allow those to flow into the kettle, leaves the grain behind. Uh, in the, and then once we're done with it, we'll put the grain in barrels, you see here, which goes to a either pig or cow farmer, kind of what picking up that day. And the kettle gets boiled with hops, and we whirlpool it, and then we'll flash cool it, put it in a fermenter. And we do that two to four times to fill a fermenter. Uh, this brew house is a little different than others. It's a little smaller. It's only maybe 17 barrels, 20 hectoliter. But a setup that we can do a lot of a variety of beers very quickly. It's very serialized. So every three hours or so, we can knock off another batch of beer. Uh, once in the fermenter, we'll add yeast. And the, uh, the yeast will ferment out most of the sugars in five, six days. It's a bigger beer, like a triple, it may take two weeks. Uh, we'll, all, we'll leave it in the fermenter typically for about three weeks, you know, where it's allowed to uh, mature, clean up a little. Uh, then we cold crash it and we'll put it in our bright tank. Uh, in the bright tank, we'll, for most of the beer, if it's going in a keg or a can, we will force carve it. And that's the way 98% of the beer is made in the U.S. 
if we're doing something like today, like we're making a triple B, we'll actually add uh, fresh yeast and a little bit of sugar back in the beer, and we'll package it uh, still and flat. If the beer is still, we can use a, a standard wine, you know, gravity filler. So we'll flush the bottle with CO2, and then uh, you know, fill it with beer, then it gets a cork put in it, um, then a cage is wrapped on it, that second machine, the Rufino Galadrino is a cager. Then we uh, dry the bottle in a, in a big air dryer. Uh, we'll put a label on it and then box it. And uh, this box warmer will warm the box. And then you, know, you can see Bob stacking them up. Then that goes to our warehouse, and as you mentioned, it will condition out in uh, two or three weeks to carb up. You know, that little bit of sugar and a little yeast, and a little more alcohol, and actually carbonate and carbonate the beer. Hello everyone, I'm here with Sarah Haney, uh, the marketing uh, position person of Adelberg's Brewery. Mm -hmm. uh, where are we at right now? We are in our finished goods warehouse because we are packaging and brewing right now and it's pretty loud over there. Yeah, they're, they're hard at work getting her done, getting some good quality beer to the people. We like it, we like it. So what's, uh, tell me a little bit about the brewery, where do y'all get the name from? So we're named after Scott's brother. Scott's our owner and founder, and we're named after Dell, his brother. Uh, Dell traveled the world, was active in the Peace Corps in his younger years, and he'd always come home with these wild and crazy life stories. So Scott thought, well, what better way to pay homage to my big brother who introduced me to beer than name the brewery after him. And then as we were opening the brewery, he started researching, you know, just asking friends and family for life stories, and all these hilarious things started coming to light. So. Uh, some of our original, our mainstays and the stuff we went to market with are all named after his wild and crazy stories. Uh, my personal favorite is Naked Nun. It's named after when Dell was in the Peace Corps. He went to Columbia and he went to go tour an old cathedral one day and at the end of the tour he decides he's going to walk back instead of take the bus back to the town he was staying in. Well, it was in the 70s, it wasn't very safe and he ends up getting robbed by bandits and they take his shoes, clothes, underwear, everything. So he was left naked as the day he's born, walking down a dirt road, and he's like, well, crap, what am I gonna do? So he comes upon a convent, but he didn't want to offend or scare the sisters with his, nude, with his nudity. So he hides among a flock of sheep, flags his sisters down, eventually they see him, take pity on him, give him a blanket and a bus <laughs> ticket home. So the joke is that he was naked, the nuns weren't, but naked gringo didn't have the same ring to it, and generous nuns helping a naked guy in Columbia doesn't really fit on a beer with Yeah, yeah, that's that's pretty that's pretty intriguing right there. Yeah. I like that. I was talking about when you're talking about robbing and stuff. I was thinking so some naked nun jumped out of the woods <laughs> and robbed the poor guy. No naked nuns they can be ruthless yeah, every it's, once in a while. It's a playful name but it really pays homage to the generosity of yeah. the nuns. And what is the naked nun? What what kind of beer Naked Nun is a wit that we brew with citrus uh coriander and a little dash of chamomile. That's excellent. That sounds delicious. Perfect for those hot summer days. Mm -hmm. Cool y'all keep you crisp, lean, ready to go. <laughs> That's a heck of a deal. So when was the brewery founded? We were founded in late 2011. Uh, we opened our doors as a 100% Belgian focused brewery. So we only did bombers and kegs. And that worked really well for several years. It was kind of our niche. But if you, as you probably noticed, the Texas beer landscape has changed oh, and yeah, grown a lot. Oh yeah, sure, yeah. So uh, we are changing and adapting with that. So we introduced cans about two years ago. Um, oh, okay. Everything we put in cans is light, easy drinking, uh, fairly on the sessionable side. Uh, and then uh, we are now even expanding even further. We are no longer 100% Belgian style. Um, so we have several beers done with London ale yeast and uh, we have some lagers in the works as well. Uh, we've also made several barrel-aged beers over the years, both in spirit barrels and also wine and uh, just wood barrels. Okay, and yeah. Some of those have been sour, some haven't. Um, so we're we're still figuring out kind of our new voice. We've got a new brew team on tat on on board, and that's really led to some great creative ideas. And uh, so I think we'll see a lot of creativity out of the brewery over the next year or two. Uh, so. Right now, my best slogan for us is we're making the best damn beer we can, yeah. period. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, it does seem like, uh, not just here in Texas, but throughout the United States with, you know, over 6,000 breweries now, I believe, mm -hmm. with the county, everybody's trying to find new creative ways. And it seems mm -hmm. like a lot of people are expanding, getting away from, what you said, kind of the niche deal, 
and uh, you know they keep that little bit of a niche with them mm -hmm. but they're starting to ex uh, expand and experiment with new styles new flavors definitely as far as our per capita population we have a very small percentage that actually drank craft beer mm -hmm. but there's more and more people coming to it every day and as more and more people come to it there's more creativity that brewers are allowed to express to meet those needs and those demands because you're not just selling to a small portion anymore yeah. that pie is always growing which is great uh, and so I think it's, it's a really exciting time to be in craft beer, to see all the creativity and ideas that are coming out. And it's also intimidating because there's a lot of breweries coming yeah. on board. The competition is growing every day. So that's why it's more about what do your consumers want? What do your brewers want to be making? Because when they're passionate, then the consumer tastes that passion. So trying to kind of correlate what the market wants and what our brewers want to make is kind of our new new tangent um, and we'll still keep making some of our, our Belgian beers I mean if we got rid of triple B and philosophizer I, I think we'd have a riot on our hands yeah so, so we'll keep making those for sure um, but also adding some creative new beers to the lineup um, some beers may become seasonal some may just be limited release as we, we kind of go about this new uh, recipe development and exploration that sounds good yeah, so, uh, what events do y'all have planned? What events are y'all going to attend this year? We just wrapped up our anniversary party this past May and that was a ton of fun. Um, coming up in, I think it's late September, we'll be sponsoring the Texas Craft Brewers Festival, okay. which is probably my favorite beer event we do all year. Um, we'll possibly enter the lottery to have a booth at GABF. Um, it's all lottery based now. Oh, okay, yeah. And then uh, we will also do our big It's the Tits Fest fundraiser in October. And uh, throughout the whole month of October, we'll carry a special glass and uh, we do a little upcharge on it and that benefits the uh, Breast Cancer Resource Center and then we'll have one big event during, during the month as well. Okay, that's awesome. We're about to uh, taste some of their wonderful, delicious brews that they got on tap, as well as bottles and cans. You can catch them at the nearest store, I believe. Well, what are we trying here? Yeah, so this first one we have here is Buzzbait Blonde. It's our widest, easiest drinking beer we make. It's super clean, refreshing. Little subtle hints of honey and peach in there uh, if you hunt for it, but. Uh, the thing I like about this beer is it smells like beer. So if yeah. you are a big beer drinker trying to make your way into the craft beer scene, Buzz Bay Blonde is the one you want to go with. Hear that, Keystone Light fan? This is the beer you need. Yep. Right See what it tastes like. Still a little cold, so the aromas haven't completely, but yeah, it's just like kind of a light lager. You know, just like a forged light or something. Mm -hmm. So I can tell you, it tastes nothing like corn bite. Definitely has uh, kind of a honey flavor to it. Mm -hmm. uh, very kind of uh, subtle sweetness. A little bit of uh, pale malt uh, flavor to it. Very easy drinking. Definitely a perfect summer beer and definitely a perfect beer for newcomers to uh, craft beer scene. Definitely one you want. Very, very easy going. After that one, we have our Triple B. This is hands down our most popular beer. Uh, it's one of the ones we launched with. Uh, triple B is both, it is a style, triple, um, but it also is a play on words. It stands for Bad Boy Brew, uh, which was one of Dell's kind of stories behind him. So, oh, okay. Um, nice uh, pear and clove notes in this one. 9.3% uh, but doesn't drink like it, so it's really, uh, become our most popular because it's yeah, so yeah. easy to drink but has all that great flavors to it. Now the triple is a little different. This one's a little bit like she said the bad boy. Nine percent. If you drink smooth, you're gonna end up next day uh, not feeling so smooth. <laughs> yeah definitely you can smell the uh, uh, vanilla notes in there, so a tad bit of caramel almost. Most of Baltimore. Yeah, very smooth. Mm -hmm. Has like a subtle sweetness to it. Uh, almost kind of like a little honey, honey touch to it almost. Yeah, it's bit. got a lot of fruity esters in there from the Trappist yeast. Yeah. Almost kind of like a little bit of a juicy peach on this sort of. Yeah. Me, every, that's what, yeah. You know, everybody has their different uh, flavors that they pick up, but mm -hmm. yeah, kind of juicy peach. Uh, after that one, we have Scratch and Hippo, which is our amber. Um, this one is uh, one of our, one of the ones we have expanded outside of the Belgian realm with. 
It's so actually uh, Buzzbait, Blonde, Scratching Hippo, and Traveling Man. All three of those are not Belgian yeast strains. Okay. They're uh, London Ale yeast. Uh, Scratching Hippo is our clean, classic, malty amber. Uh, it's going to be exactly that balanced malt with just a little subtle hop bitterness running in the back over there. Yeah, mm -hmm. come on, you sweet. Now, this is the uh, Scratching Hippo, the amber ale. Hmm. A little bit of roasted malt caramel in there. Definitely has a slight uh, hot bite to it towards the back, mm -hmm. like you're saying. It definitely has a nice uh, slight caramel sweetness, uh, some good uh, toasted kind of flavored, light toasted flavors mm -hmm. to it. So uh, that's definitely very nice. Uh, this would do perfect for fall time. Mm -hmm. This would be a perfect fall time beer right here, Oktoberfest almost. <laughs> and then our final one is Traveling Man. It's our rotating hop IPA. Uh, it's got on the bottom of it that lists the three uh, hops that are in the, the batch. So this one's Citra, Mosaic, and El Dorado. Um, the, these should always be a little bit on the juicy side, some fruit forward notes, um, but it has a nice amalgamation of flavors. Mmm, juicy as can be. Smells like a big batch of tropical fruits, mango in there, a little bit of pineapple. Make you feel like you're on the Caribbean or Hawaii. Very smooth. It actually mm -hmm. doesn't have a very uh, strong hop bite to it, to be honest. Very smooth, easy drinking, very juicy, very, very juicy, delicious. Mm -hmm. Like I said, this is like beachside right here. Have a few of these though. How, how much percentage are we talking about? It's about seven percent. Yeah, a few of these on the beach, you'll be laying there, it'll be sunburned, look like a lobster going mm -hmm. back to the hotel. They're delicious brews. I really appreciate your time and everything. Of course. And, uh, it's a wonderful brewery. If you ever get a chance to come into Austin, you need to stop by Aldebert, Al, Aldebert's Brewery. Trust me, you'll be satisfied with all their delicious brews, uh, great people, and tons of barrels and wonderful scenery they got going on. They have a bunch of arcade games for those that are old school like myself. Go ahead, enjoy it. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe. Cheers.